And hello. And good morning. We are live, I think. Why can't I hear anything? Oh, this is going to be an interesting day. Why can't I hear myself? Oh, here we go. It's a Monday. Hello, 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 hello. Now this is very strange. Hello? Weird? Off? Hello? Hello, hello? That's very loud, and now I'm hearing kind of a double thing. I'm not sure what any of this means. Ah, uh, it's a Monday. Very weird. I don't know what's going on with my microphone. Hey, it's Gordon. I can't hear myself. It's very bizarre. I don't like this feeling. I'm glad you can hear me, though, so I guess I'll just carry on. But why wear headphones if I can't hear myself? It's not making no sense to me. Hello. Oh, that's too loud. Now I can't turn it off. Oh, something's up. Something weird is happening. Something's happening here. But it is ain't quite clear. There's a man with a gun over there. It's something weird with my mix. Oh, now I sort of hear myself. No, it's all wires. And now it's not even opening. Man, elegant auto sound. Oh, now it's open. Okay, so turn that off. It's not turning off now. Hmm. Turn that off. Oh, that's just weird. And turn that on. I can't hear myself. Oh, forget it. If you can hear me, and I can hear you, then I guess that's the only thing that matters. Oh my gosh. It's only 9.05 on Monday. We haven't even started. And it's rainy. Okay, if you can hear me, that's great. I can't hear myself. And I have no idea why. It's very weird. Oh well, so it's rainy here. 75 degrees, so it's hot, humid, rainy, gloomy, ugly day. My shirt looks black. My shirt is actually a beautiful green color. We have new balloons for any balloon loons that happen to be in the audience. And those are the infamous balloons from earlier last week that turn opaque. Right now, they're not turning opaque. They're staying clear, which is fine. I accept. And there's so much to talk about, and I've all confused myself trying to figure out what to do next and where we are. Oh, computers, this is see, this is this is what I get for not restarting my computer every time before we start the show. I fired up Streamlabs said we don't have a camera. <laughs> so I go into NVIDIA Broadcast, and for some reason, NVIDIA Broadcast has picked no camera. It used to pick the Brio camera, now it's picked no camera. There is a haunting among us. But the microphone was okay. 
I can see that my microphone seems to be okay. But then I can't hear myself, which has never happened before. And the mix has never been right because the mix you're supposed to have is not what I am hearing here with my fan and my noise. I am supposed to be hearing the beautiful mix that you are hearing at home because then I know if I have a problem. I'm not hearing my local mix. I'm hearing the real mix. I can't figure out how to make it happen. Oh, I think I may have just figured this out. Hello, hello. Ah, now here we go. Now there's a little bit of an echo, which is very weird. Why am I hearing an echo? If I'm echoing at home, I apologize. If I'm not echoing at home, I don't know what I'm doing here. Well, the echo may almost makes it worse than we're not wearing the headphones, but I did figure out what was going on, I think. Why is there an echo? I don't know. Nobody knows. Now, is there an echo? Yeah, still an echo. Weird. Very weird. I still hear the air conditioning, so the sound is... The raw feed and not the real feed. Now I hear nothing. Weird. Hello, hello. Oh, oh, now maybe I'm hearing something. Something I'm not supposed to be hearing. And now I'm hearing something I'm not supposed to be hearing. This is very strange. Now I'm not sure which one I want to use. Well, hey, this is fun. It's called uh, Fun with Speakers and Headphones, but I'm still getting an echo, and I don't know why. Hmm. That's weird. That's not what I want. Nah. Uh oh, oh, it just barfed. The whole thing just barfed. Uh, too many cookies. What did I do now? I may have just ruined everything. <laughs> hello, hello. Well, there's still a little bit of an echo, and I don't know why. Because I like having my headphones on, because then I know if my music is working. But the echo is very strange. Yeah, that's off. That's off. System. Turn off the system. Doesn't make any difference. Hello, 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 hello. This is supposedly what I'm hearing. But then again, maybe not. So weird. If I don't speak, I'm not bothered by it. I'm taking it off. So I'll have to keep my eye on my music to see if my music is going to stop playing or not because I can't hear anything. It's so weird. Oh, I hate computers. Give me an apple that works. So it's Monday. I did my exercises today. I am now doing my Turkish get-ups almost exclusively now because it come run thought. Sometimes I do the press. Sometimes I do the up and downs, the kettlebell swings. Now I'm into Turkish get-ups. And I have been slowly increasing my strength by adding weight. And today was a milestone where I went up to my 44 pound weight, which is a lot. And these are not my favorite kettlebells because for every kettlebell is designed a little bit differently. But the kettlebell that I am using now has a very, very tiny base. 
Most kettlebells have a little bit bigger base, so they don't tip over. But this one has a very small base like this. It tips over very easily. You, you look at it wrong and it tips over. But what that also does is a very tiny base at 44 pounds tends to really punch holes in whatever it happens to be sitting on. Be it the floor, your exercise mat, your toe. It is my least favorite brand of kettlebell, but a very popular brand and well made. However, dangerous. If you just happen to brush it with your foot, which happens, it tips over and then makes a noise or lands on your other foot. But that seems to be where my prime point is in my exercise routine. Is 44 pounds. And then there's, you go up and there's one more that's supposed to be the ideal weight, which is nine pounds heavier than that. But I've never really been able to master that one. That one's just always a little bit too heavy, except for swings, but trying to press, trying to hold it up and then stand. I can do a Turkish press perfectly with almost any weight that I have here, except when it comes to the point of standing up. That's where my weakness is. And sometimes you get momentum and you raise your arm, you have your arm right here and you raise your arm, try to get up, oh, and it usually works. Today was a good day, actually, because I did well with 44 pounds. When you're holding it up, sometimes it does wiggle just a little bit, so you have to stop and really concentrate on safety because if you get out of line just a little bit this way, and then you try to stand up, you're gonna fall over. And you don't ever want to fall over. And the number one rule of a kettlebell is if you are in trouble and the kettlebell is out of alignment, you drop the bell. You don't have to throw it, but don't try to catch it. Don't try to pull it back. Don't try to redirect it into the opposite direction. That's how you get hurt. Really, really hurt. And there's a big video of one of the masters of kettlebells. And all he does for about 10 minutes in various different positions is show you how to let go of your kettlebell. You know, when you're swinging, people say, oh, it's going to go, you know, if I let it go, it's going to go through my window. It's going to break the chair. And he just shows you if you and you have to let it go out here. It's not going to keep going. It's going to go like this. And it does. So that's very valuable. And I admit that over my kettlebell, young kettlebell life, there have been times where I have been out of alignment this way and I stand and I try to struggle to get back where I should just let the bell go. But I don't because I'm proud and stupid. Well, I hope we had a good and interesting weekend. We had one here. January had great shows on Saturday and Sunday, talking about very interesting points of view about disability and the row ruling. And then you try to, you know, on the weekends, chill, have a little bit of a good time, try to survive the day. And for a while, on several channels, you could watch the John Wick trilogy, Mr. Wick, one after the other. So it's like six hours of viewing pleasure if you're into that kind of thing. And I love John Wick. I love Keanu. And it's sort of become a temptation in our home that when John Wick is on, we have a viewing party, at least with one of us. She used to play along, but then, you know, after it's on every weekend for, you know, four weeks in a row, that she tends to prefer to want to watch something. So I watched the John Wick show, a viewing party, for about five minutes. John Wick 1 was great, and then John Wick 2 started, which is not great. That has the fake deaf person in it.
And I get this for the entire freaking show. Okay, Keanu's battling for his life. And as I discussed last week, in our Rage and Fury, about the Judge Mathis show with the bugs here and here, taking up 30% of the screen, for the entire John Wick marathon, except for chapter one, we had this ugly, 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 ugly bug for the new Minions movie. Outrage, I say. Five day. We're going to get five days of this on the Sci-Fi channel, which is usually one of my favorite channels to watch. But they're going to put this junk in the middle of Mr. Wick. We're going to have problems. Meaning I'm going to change the channel. And this is the big fight scene that is exciting and fun. And look, look how beautifully this scene is composed with the angles and the fighting and the brick overlooking Italy. It's gorgeous. And then you have this gigantic, ugly thing staring at you in the corner. And it's very bright. And these little lines around here wiggle. They're slightly animated, just enough to take your eye off what's going on here to see if John Wick will live or not. And it goes up here. Why? That's my question to you. Why? And then you give up on Mr. Wick. And you're getting ready for the bed to get up for the show the next day with your beautiful wife next to you. And she loves Law and Order. And I do too, up to a point. The early shows are the best. The first 10 years. But you have to remember these years are really divided by two because they have two seasons now. It used to be in the old days, a season was one year of shows. 26 shows. Now they divide the season into a year into two years. Season one and two are part of the calendar year. And the early shows are great. The writing was better when Lenny was alive. Terrific. So they were doing this very interesting, interesting show about Tay-Sachs disease, which I guess is a problem. And according to that show, that episode, the Jewish community, where two Jews, if they're born Jewish, have a history, they get tested before they get married to see if their children will have this terrible, terrible disease. And Judd Hirsch was the doctor, and it was a beautiful, beautifully written, acted show. According to me, it is a problem, Gordon says. I hope you're not talking about the sound. I hope you're talking about Tay Sachs, but we're not sure. So it's a rare genetic order that Judd Hirsch explains on the stand that Tay Sachs, yeah. And this woman killed her baby, but didn't tell her husband. And that's the story of the law and order. And then at the very end, we find out that she had an affair with a Jewish man who has Tay Sachs and his family. And she didn't know that. It was just one time. Her husband converted. He's Catholic. He said, please don't say anything. That's why my wife didn't tell me, because she didn't want to get me involved. And it was a really messy, awful thing, but a fantastic, interesting story about religion and choice. And this is what you got for the entire episode. Now, as you can see, I changed the channel from sci-fi to USA. And they're talking about Tay Sachs for an hour and up there in the corner of the screen, throbbing and undulating. You get this minion five days. And if, if it would appear and then disappear, okay. But they leave it on for the whole show. They only take it away when they show you the commercials. And it's very, very, very annoying. So Judd Hirsch 
is talking about Tay Sachs and this grieving Jewish mother. I don't know the actress, but she's been in everything. I especially know her from the TV show V. And this, she was very young, very fantastic, dark hair. She's now blonde. Wonderful, wonderful actress. And it's all ruined by this stupid minion thing in the corner. And you know, they say, oh, come on. People have seen John Wick a hundred times. Oh, Tay Sachs, they talked about on Law and Order. Yeah, this is the hundredth time we've run the show. Well, for some people, it's their first experience watching a show. For some people, they've never seen the episode before. They want to concentrate on it. How can you concentrate on anything when you have this thing? This bug in Stabler's ear. It's ridiculous. And I don't like it. And now we have so many things to talk about when it comes to NFTs and artwork and people and how art really does contain the hopes, dreams, and fears of a lot of people. And the important lesson to learn is we have to take people where we find them. And that's a very hard lesson for people who are regionalized by geography. You know, you grow up isolated in the Midwest or down South. Everyone around you is like you. Everything is homogenized. Everybody thinks the same way. You were all raised in the same church, the same way of thinking. And then if you're lucky and you can get out a little bit and not for a vacation, but to get out and live somewhere else, as I've said many times, you don't have to be where you're from. And you learn that there are people who are at different places in their lives. And the simplest example of accepting people where you find them, accepting people where they land, is if you just talk about a child. Let's say a five-year-old child. You would not sit down and have a, a conversation about a, with a five-year-old child about... Uh, is a, a fetus a baby or not? That That's not where the child has landed. The child is a different point of view, a different take on the world, an understanding that may not be able to parse or refine the intricacies of when life begins. And then you have to expand that into something that's more complex and more difficult, like the war in Ukraine. There are a couple of NFT artists that I am having conversations with who are terrific. And they're in Ukraine and suffering. And one says he's on the front lines a lot. He has four kids and he doesn't know how they're going to survive without him, which we'll get into in a moment. Then we have our friend Igba, who is Russian, left for the safety of his family. We're living in Georgia, not the United States, Georgia, but Georgia, Georgia. And no one would hire him because he was Russian and he was an immigrant. So the only choice he had was to return back to Russia. So that is the hardest lesson to learn is to find people and communicate with them where they are and was brought home to me over the weekend because the Facebook beta is starting today. I mean, I mean, a social media, a social media beta is starting today. It hasn't started yet. I keep checking, but it's not live yet. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit more detail, but it's so interesting to me that there are different pathways of how people choose to communicate. Our good friend, Gordon, we communicate mainly in email, which is my where I prefer to talk. Our friend Igba, who is very active on Twitter, prefers to communicate with me in Discord. Okay. It would be great if we were all in one place where we could all share the same idea, but that's not happening. And everybody else that I'm speaking with so far are all on Twitter in direct messages. That is their preferred landing place where they feel safest, easiest place to go. Not really on Facebook. 
Not on TikTok at all. WhatsApp, Messenger, none of that. It's Twitter direct messages, email, and Discord. And then we have to think about this Roe thing, this abortion thing, and we will talk about that more in depth as the show goes on. And you have to realize there are people coming from different places on this. And the genius thing that the right have done is made it a political idea that a fetus is a baby. And if that's the fantasy that they begin, that's the beginning of their argument. And you don't argue not that, but something else, that a woman's right to choose is above all else everything. And I'm reading online there, women are saying, look, this doesn't have to be about violence or about rape or incest. That's a mistake to make abortion about that. Abortion is merely about a woman's choice to control what she wants to do with her body. That is what this is about. Violence doesn't have, violence muddies the water. And that's what a lot of people are saying. They say this worst case scenario. A son impregnates a daughter. And then what do you do? Well, that's complicated and hard, but that's not really what the topic is about. Oh, it's a baby. Really? And if you meet them there where they landed and you don't believe as they do, you will never be able to have a conversation with them. So how do you navigate that landscape of finding them where they are and where you are? And I'm not sure a lot of this is going to ever be navigable. And right now we have temporarily safe havens of blue states, but you get someone like a Ron DeSantis in there and you give him a Republican Senate and a Congress and it's all going to change. They are going to say that a fetus is a person, period. Fetal personhood, that's what they're going after. And it's going to be a very difficult, interesting thing. Oh, there's so many more things to talk about, but right now, take a little break. Back in a moment.
And hey, we are back live on Bowles.tv, B-O-L-E-S dot TV. It's weird not having my headphones on, but I'm dealing with it. And I need to stop talking about it because the pet peeve I have is watching other streamers talking about all the technical problems they're having and they won't shut up about it. So I'm shutting up about it. Jan Marie is here, still working telecommuting now because of some sort of emergency in the office. Something up with the HVAC system that sent everyone home last, what was it, Thursday? Pack up and go. <laughs> so she's still here. <laughs> Trying to figure it out. Very weird. So, talking about Tay Sachs, this I decided, why not just show this? This is the episode. It was called Mercy, season four. When they were all very young and fabulous on that show, nobody was a, really a superstar yet. Originally aired January 31st, 2003, almost 20 years ago. And boy, how far we have not come as a human race. 8.3 out of 10, I give it a 10 out of 10. I mean, Judd Hirsch in that episode is just fabulous. When the body of a baby girl is found inside a cooler, detectives need to investigate just who she is and how she got there. They certainly learned the little girl had a genetic disorder. And let's look at the acting. So we know all of these people. Ice-T, B.D. Wong, Chris, Marishka, Richard. They're all great. Greg Edelman's terrific. And then we keep going. And here's, this is her. Elizabeth Mitchell. She had very dark hair, very young, 20 years ago. I mean, very young, I'm saying, because she doesn't look anything like she looks now. Now she has this gorgeous, mature-looking face. Back then, she had a big baby face. And she was fabulous. And what else has she done? I keep saying V. That's where I know her from, for some reason. And what are her credits? She was in The Purge, Running Scared. I guess she was on Lost. I never watched that show. I guess that's what she's known for. Not very much. Santa Claus, first kill. Boy, she's terrific. She was the mother who killed her own baby. Oof. That's what life is about. Those kind of choices you have to make. Between doing the right thing and doing what's necessary. So our social media beta starts today. The onboarding process was supposed to start Friday, and I was sent emails about this, so this is all going to work. I was sent a big PDF file on how this is all going to work. Okay, I get it. I studied it. But you can't do anything until today. And as I mentioned to a friend over the weekend, uh, you know, Facebook, when they interact, at least with me, it's usually about 2 p.m. my time, 2 p.m. Eastern. And Bulls.TV is live Monday through Friday at 9 a.m. Eastern. So by the time I, you know, I hear from them or they need something done, it's half my day is over. For what it's worth, Commissioner Gordon has said something. Instagram. Boom. <gasps> there she is, Elizabeth Mitchell. I have such admiration and respect for her. Now, this is just silly and goofy, which she is, which is fine. But boy, what an actress. Wow. And I keep talking about V because that's where we really discovered her. And she was just terrific in that. And it was a weird show, but there were a lot of stars came out of it. Oh, she's all bloody. This is not the look we are looking for. I want to see her as the grieving mother and honor. Oh, she's standing on her bed. Or somebody is standing on a bed. Oh, that's illegal. No bed standing, please. <laughs> I don't understand what any of this is about, but I just love seeing her face. The bathroom shot, but at least we get to see her face. I wish we could go back in time for 20 years ago. Boy, she's terrific, though. So thank you for that, Mike Gordon. So this unknown social media company that we're testing, and it is an alpha test. They made that clear in the email. The alpha test begins today and goes until like the 22nd of July. 
and onboarding begins today, which I don't really know what that means. Because there's supposed to be something that's turned on in your account that allows you to connect an NFT wallet. Now, I think that should have been activated on Friday. So you have the weekend to get everything ready and then, hey, it debuts on Monday. They're not doing it that way. So I checked this morning, checked right before it went live. I don't see that as a possibility. So I'll wait until, you know, two o'clock my time and email them and say, is this happening today? I don't see this available on my page, whatever page that might be. But and in anticipation of going live today, I did a, a question and answer interview with our friend Ishita Banerjee of Soul Curry Art. And we're going to talk about her in depth a little bit later. Uh, talking about landing, where you think a person's one place and then you find out they've landed somewhere else. And then you're sort of lucky to find out where they've landed because they told you. Yes, I'm being mysterious. So this is my open sea Bulls TV beta page that I created just for this social media beta test. And actually, it's an alpha test. But nobody knows what an alpha is unless you're a beta tester. And if you're a beta tester, you really don't want to know what an alpha is because that's where all the trouble comes. In the alpha. Because nothing works. So this is that wallet. OpenSea now allows you to feature superstars. So here is some of Ishita's work that we'll be discussing. We did a long Q&A together. I think I gave her five questions and a bonus question. And I tend to ask her long questions and she tends to answer me in paragraphs. So as I said to her, we've written a book together, which is not a bad thing. I'm hoping that will appear today, but who knows? This is Ian Jones in the UK. Alexander. Now, this is another interesting story that we're going to get to in a moment. Then our friend Igba, who we're going to discuss momentarily. And hey, hey, it's old new friend Garden. And then, of course, the Jan Marie. This is sort of a placeholder in case we don't get any other artists. We'll just interview the Jan Marie, who really doesn't know anything about NFTs, but who will when we interview her. And then this is another placeholder of these ridiculous me NFTs that are just completely silly. Although, as you can see, I did add one over the weekend. Someone was selling it, I think, for $12 because I love the alien eyes. I think they're just delightful and I don't see a lot of them. I do see poopy things on people's heads though. And then just this also, if we need that. So Ishida we're covering today and later in the week, we'll be talking to our friend Igba. And Igba is, I he was in exile. Now he's back in Russia, having a hard time with the war, has no money. So I tried to help him out a little bit. He had something on sale and I said, OK, I have one piece from you, which is this. Extract Crypto Girl, which I think is terrific. I like it. It's a painting. He took a picture. It's a painting. And then I saw that he had this on sale. Good morning. Good night. Universe piece. OK, click on it. Good price. Reasonable. Help out a friend in need. I like the yin and the yang. If you look at this, I have made it my profile picture because as a circle, it works good as a circle. And of course, he profusely thanked me because I said, Igba, I mean, you're I'm you're the, in the first week. We have a sheet on Monday and you may be like on Wednesday or Thursday. So 
I don't think one NFT is really enough to give you the kind of exposure and conversational value that I think that we need to have in our Q&A. And he did agree to do a Q&A, even though he doesn't speak English. So I'll make it very clear that I'm asking him these questions in English and he's using a translator, a software translator to respond. And we do that almost every day on Discord privately. And it works very well. He, he's concerned about it because he doesn't know if he's being understood. And I said, it's I believe it's fine. So he's trusting me on this and it will be fine. And now because of this, we have his abstract piece. And now we have this, which is black and white, morning, night, morning becomes evening, day becomes evening. The duality of life is what he calls it. And I think it's very lovely. It gives me another pathway to ask him questions about his artwork. And he was very happy with that. And then he sends me on Discord this. Which is the animated version of the static NFT that I had purchased from him moments before. And I said, Ig, but why, why, why aren't you selling this? It's an eight second video. And as he explains, it's eight is the infinity number, the beginning and end of everything. It's the forever symbol, which I like. And he animated this and he drew this and he animated it. And he said, this is the world from Antarctica looking down at the world. Morning into noon, noon into night, night into day. Okay, fabulous. I said, what, what, why wouldn't you sell this? Why would you sell static? What, 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 what? He says, that's really cool. It is cool. And Igba said, I'll airdrop it to you. Now, all this time, he hasn't been able to airdrop me anything because he doesn't have any money. He has five cents in his Ethereum wallet. But then I realized, OK, I sent some things back and forth just to myself from one account to another over the weekend. And gas was really low. It was like three dollars. So I thought, OK, he must have checked his gas price. And I he had just gotten a little bit of money from that sale. So he was going to use money from that sale to airdrop me this video. So I said, fantastic. Now, in our Q&A, we can talk about this duality of life, living in a war zone, trying to create art that lives. And what is a dead image versus an animated living image. That gives us something to chat about in our Q&A. And he was like, OK, great, we'll do that. And I said, OK, great. And again, I was reminded of finding people where they land. Before I guess that sale was made, he was not able to either upload or share the video version of this, which I know he prefers to the static image because he sort of told me that. I said, just sell the movie and attach the image. That's how you do that with this thing. And then that's where he said, OK, I'll send it to you. <laughs> But he, he wasn't able to do that until I found him because I wanted to give him a little bit more exposure than just one piece in our social media alpha test that we are hoping will go well today. And last week, when we talked about our friend, Igba, and how Igba has a really active and tremendous following on Twitter. There is no doubt about that, I can tell you. And when Igba responds and likes stuff, people respond to him and say, that's great. And then they tend to follow me. Now, I sort of hope that some of these people are very talented. And I wish that they would say, hey, could I send you something? Can I be in this social media? But they never do. Or at least I don't see it on Twitter. Now, Twitter does filter 
some stuff that I get because it's a verified account. But if they're interesting people who follow me, I follow them back, which should technically mean that they can talk to me without being filled. And as I said last week, this kind of Russian doll experience of a Russian doll within a doll within a doll. And how interesting it is that so many of these people who happen to be Russian and artists and trying to sell NFTs tend to like, and they're young women raised in Russia in the Russian aesthetic, they tend to draw and sell naked bodies, which is usually naked boobies and butts. And I showed that to you last week. And now after this go around with this video from Igba, I have a whole new set of Russian dolls that I'm going to show you right now. And I'm warning you in three, two, one, turn away if you don't like seeing a little bit of booby. The expression sex saddles is international. Yeah. Now, this is sort of the theme of it. Always sort of cartoonish, not realistic, with the boobies and the butt. So this one, you're getting both. Okay, not my style. There are a couple of those artists that I thought were really, really terrific. But most of it was in this style, in this vein. And here's one artist, same background. This is the arched back, which seems to be very popular with the boobies and the butt. And then there's another piece, same sort of background, just with the backside. And the same artist, same background with the front side. Now, these, I don't believe, are selling very well. But this is what I call the identifiable young female Russian NFT aesthetic. This is a different artist. There is There are two of these. One has the X down below. The other one has the X on top. So I guess you'd want both of them. So you can see everything. Here's another one, sort of interesting. Again, you get the arched back, which is, I guess, very important in these things. And the booby here and the booby here. Slightly different, sort of interesting, not really my style. This, another artist. Okay, not quite as cartoonish, sort of realistic. It appears that it's some kind of crochet or knitting something with socks and panties and the boobies. This is by the same artist. The socks are different. The panties are on. Boobies changing a light bulb. I'm not exactly sure what's going on here. But again, with this arched back, and they all have the same sort of shape of breast. I'm calling the Russian aesthetic. Now we go into a very different sort of thing, what I still call this Russian doll aesthetic. Where this artist has beheaded the women. With the suggestion of these, but not quite as prominent. But you can see if you look. Okay, not sure I understand what's going on, and that's okay. I don't have to really understand anything. So these are the boobies with, you know, X's over them, but the head is still beheaded. It's an interesting take on the female body. Boobies, a beheading. This, I'm not sure who this is meant for. This, again... The cut-off head and the flowers for the booby front. And then sort of a final stylized cartoonish. They, these artists, these Russian dolls seem to prefer really these this color palette, which is a pink, a blue, a teal, and a dark blue. And the boobies, and the arched back, the white body. Again, not my style, 
but a very definite point of view on how this all is together in a cascading Russian doll. So it's really fascinating to see who follows me based on what Igba says, and then to see what they're trying to do in their art world life. And when we come back from the break, we're going to have a very interesting conversation about embedding a soul into an NFT. Now, this is not my idea. This is not my preference. This is a choice by an artist. And as we're trying to learn and accept in this show, we try to accept people where they land. Back in a
and we are back and I put my headphones back on and I'm hearing double. I'm taking it off. It's all habit. I guess we can still hear. So two things that I wanted to mention to you while I was on break. One is that Jana Marie uh, is home because of some kind of infection in the HVAC system. And there are a lot of people in her office who don't wear masks anymore. They just take it off and they don't worry about it. And Jana and several other people in her office who are older, wiser and smarter, wear their mask as often as possible. And there have been people who have been getting mysteriously ill in the office, which I guess has now been traced back to some kind of stuff thing, mold, whatever, in the HVAC system that they're, I guess, fixing. So it shows that you can be smart by just being careful and knowing that a mask can save you a lot of misery and not just from COVID-19. The other thing I want to mention is my 44 pound kettlebell that I really love. It fits my arm well. It's just that it tends to punch holes in things is made by Rogue Fitness. Now, Rogue Fitness is one of my favorite fitness operators. I believe they're in Ohio. They build their own stuff. It's very high quality. People spend $50,000 to buy everything Rogue and have it delivered so they can set up a home gym in their garage. Rogue stuff is heavy and well-built and very easy to put together. I highly recommend them. But their kettlebell design sucks. So we're talking about finding people where they are and you find people where they land and you communicate with them on that level and then something happens and something changes and it all switches. And it's happened a little bit with our friend Ishita and it happened just this morning. <laughs> I love how you say sucks. Well, thank you very much, Gordon. If you're being honest, Why wouldn't you be honest? Well, if, what well, are you or if? And then people change and situations change. So Ishita, we have a different view of her, not necessarily positive or negative, but neutral and interesting and observant, which we'll talk about in a moment. And our newest friend, Alexander who flipped everything around on me this morning. Now, Alexander is also, hey, Gordon says, this morning I placed an order for a vegan workout shake supplement just because someone wrote a nasty comment on their Facebook page. Well, that's the way you do it, exactly. You fight back. I like that. Stand up to the Karens. And the Chads or the Kens or the Butterworths or whatever their name is for the male version. And it's funny because Karen was a very popular name when I was growing up. Several Karens in high school. Maybe it's a Midwestern thing. And now in their old age, they have to put up with this whole Karen thing. And I'm sure it's very dispiriting to them. <laughs> oh, Karen. <laughs> and a lot of them probably don't deserve it because they're very liberal. And nice people, they would never be a Karen, even though their name is Karen. If I were a Karen, I would change my name to my middle name, whatever it is. Just like when I grew up, there were a lot of Davids. There still are, of a certain age. It's a very boring name. My father wanted to call me Rocky, if you can believe that. And this is in 1965, before there was any sort of Rocky movie. And then his last name was Isherwood. So I would have been Rocky Isherwood. And my mother said, no, you're not naming my son Rocky. So I got David, which is sucks. Bad. William's the middle name. Meh. Too many bills. I liked Keith. That's who I wanted to be. Now, today you can say, call me Keith, and people will call you Keith. But back then, no, 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 no. We don't do that. We don't have nicknames. Birth names. And probably because of Keith Partridge. 
I'm thinking. I wanted to be cool like him. So our friend Alexander... And then you saw how Keith Richards turned out. Well, he is a survivor. I have great respect for Keith Richards. I mean, the guy is an addict who is not dead yet. And he's very, very immensely talented. And I have great respect for his survival ability because he should have been dead a long time ago. But there's something about him. I saw something, Keith, Keith not, the, Mick Jagger dancing over the weekend running back and forth on the stage. You say, can you believe he's 78 years old? I don't know if that's true or not. Making you want to be a Keith even more. Sure. Keiths are invincible. Keith Partridge forever. Brian Keith, right? Family affair. A lot of Keiths in the 60s and the 70s. So there's that old saying. Oh, Ben Gordon's here. The way Dick Van Dyke is still dancing is impressive. But he has a daily routine that would exhaust many 20-year-olds. Yeah, he's another amazing, amazing talent. Is he, what, 98 now? Amazing work. And there's Mary Tyler Moore, who shockingly lived to a ripe old age, having severe childhood diabetes. And she was on insulin all of her life when she was a dancer and a performer and talented and smart and wonderful. And I don't want to say she outlived her disease, but I think she outlived what a lot of people thought was possible for someone her age and when, when she was diagnosed. So there's this, this old saying that when people show you who they are and believe them, and it's usually negative. And usually has been aimed at by conservatives who have said for 50 years, we're going to turn over Roe because a fetus is a baby. And the liberals, middle class, just kind of laugh at them and say, OK. And then they go about and get it done. And they didn't think they were going to get it done through the Supreme Court. They thought they were going to get it done through the states and legislation. So Trump was their golden boy blessing to them. But it's also true that when people show you who they are, believe them, it can be a good thing. So our new friend Alexander is a Ukrainian. He has four children. He makes NFT art as one way of supporting his family. And he says he spends a lot of time on the front line, you know, feeding troops, I don't know if he's particularly fighting, but he says that's where he spends most of his day. So if you want to find him and to talk to him, it's usually late at night, my time or early morning, my time, late afternoon. And he, I guess is a friend of Igba's, last week heard about this social media beta test and wanted to be involved. And he, on his own, airdropped me three pieces of art, which I thought was great. I loved it. And this was the first piece he sent me graduation day during the war. Photograph he took, difficult, a brutal, and fascinating. That is his current reality. Where he stands. He also sent this piece which is a dog pulling a person from a burning car with a tank over here. Oops. In the upper right-hand corner. And finally, he sent this piece, which is an eye with a protesting hand in front of it. Okay, interesting. So when we do a Q&A with him, we're going to talk about the war. We're going to talk about the inspiration for his art living and dying every day on the lines. And then I guess he saw my conversation with Igba about the spinning night and day movie that he sent me and people were responding to it and I was responding to it and it went well. And so our friend Alexander 
they sent me a Twitter message. And I didn't understand it at first. But he said, hey, this is an NFT that I am selling. And it's uh, frightening looking based on the war. And as I understood him, he said, and I have embedded a soul into this NFT. And I pledge that soul to live long after I'm gone to provide for my children and my family. And I wrote back and I said, well, it's very frightening. I'm not sure this is a good thing for social media. Beta test, alpha test. Not really their thing. But he was not offering to airdrop it to me. But I said, I'm confused. Is this your soul that's in this that you're, that you're selling? You're selling your soul? Or this is, you've created a soul for the NFT that you're selling? And he responded to me, and I don't really understand what he said, but this is the piece of artwork. This is what he sent me. Soul sale. Okay. So this is what he's selling, which I find terrifying. I appreciate this. I would have this in my collection. Is this something that I would try to get into the collection for the alpha beta test? No, I don't think it would go over well. But if I had the, inspir the inspiration to purchase it, I would. But I am concerned about the soul thing. Because in America, there's a sell your soul to the devil, which has been very popular in comic books. Ghost Rider, Robert Johnson sold his soul to the devil so he could play the guitar. It's a thing, a cultural thing, selling your soul. So there have been 90 views of this. The sale is ending July 1st. Hey, Gordon says it kind of looks like the Terminator Ultron from the Avengers. That's exactly right. And maybe a little bit of Voldemort because there's no nose. And he is selling this NFT in all sincerity and seriousness. I don't think he knows who he's dealing with because I don't have $185,000. He is selling this for 150 Ethereum. And the sale ends July 1st, which is what, Friday? But I'm not making fun of him. I'm just laughing at my situation because he's very serious about this. Now, I guess you could make an offer, you know, for one Ethereum. Now, the description is where it gets interesting, and this is what I'm going to rely on because this is public and this is not our private conversation. I, Alexander Grushansky, confirmed that I put up for sale in the form of an NFT soul. Buyer gets all the rights to use the soul at its discretion. Honesty and responsibility guarantee. Along with the soul, the buyer will get any NFT from my collection. This is not just hype. I have a large family and there is a war in my country. I really want to know that if something happens to me, my children will not be lost. About my crazy life, this collection I have collected work that came spontaneously here and from the state of mind and mood life during the war in my country has changed my inner world. I want to believe in good times, but I cannot see the white stripe behind the black one. Thank you for all the likes and attention to my work. May God bless you. 
So this is very interesting, very serious. I'm not sure I understand it entirely. I respect the effort to provide for your family and to leave something behind. I'm not sure if anyone is going to pay $185,000 for this. And I'm not sure what... I'm still a little confused about the soul that's embedded in the NFT. I don't understand how that worked. I don't understand if it's part of the contract. And that's... My Angelou said, when people show you who they are, believe you. And Alexander has shown us that he is a very serious person who is very worried about the life of his children and their well-being after he's gone. And we know he spends his days on the front lines of the war in Ukraine. So this is a very different kind of conversation now that I'm going to have with Alexander eventually when we do our beta test, alpha test Q&A. Because now there's a whole different realm of understanding behind the purpose and design of his NFTs. And if someone wanted to purchase this for one Ethereum, would he sell it for that? Or is that an insult? I don't know. But it's terribly interesting. And it makes you wonder. What's going to happen next? Soul selling via NFTs. And the interesting thing is. You can have any other piece that he has created in addition to that piece, which is quite curious to me. And so I guess this is some of his other work. Very alarming, I would say, in my own old-fashioned way, very Russian, very Ukrainian, very Eastern European. Dim, dark, deadly. Full of the wages of sin. And probably a lot of desperation. Oh, now that's funny. That's a Twitter. Uh, that would be fun to have. That's sort of lighthearted, I would say. I would blame you. And this is how it goes. Oh, there we get the Russian. Russian form. The beautifulness of the body. And hey, I accept that. You know, young, beautiful Russian women celebrating young, beautiful Russian women in their artwork. It makes sense. They work hard to project who they are and who they want to become. And now we're going to take a slightly early break because the next piece I want to start in on is about our friend Ishita. And it's different and slightly complex. So I don't want to start it and then we're going to get interrupted by an ad break. So we'll take a break now, come right back, and then we'll talk about finding someone else who has landed in a different place than you expect. Back in a moment.
and we are back from break. I'm David Bowles. This is Bowles.tv, B-O-L-E-S dot TV. Live Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. Eastern. Well, it's interesting when you have uh, someone in your household who is telecommuting and you take a blood pressure break. And when you're here by yourself, you take a blood pressure break and you come back. And when you have someone who's telecommuting and you check on them to say hi, you suddenly become employed. Do you think you could get me some iced tea? Do you think, would you mind? Is it possible? Okay. But I'm back. Sort of. So now we get into a very, very interesting topic. And I have to be very careful that it doesn't appear that I'm picking on anybody because it will appear that way. And I don't want it to appear that way because I'm not trying to. But sometimes when you ask people questions, they feel picked upon. And I'm not saying that anyone has expressed that they are feeling picked upon. I'm just saying, in my experience, having these conversations, few people feel picked upon. So I'm going to start this conversation with certain people and certain names. And then if I were smart, I would change the name of the picked upon person from Ishita to, let's say, Gordon. Because Gordon doesn't mind. Gordon knows I'm not picking on him. But I won't do that. I'll just say generally an NFT artist or something. But I have to start with the specific to set the table of what we're going to have the conversation about. So our good friend Ishita, who lives in Canada, and she is a good Canadian, and I mean that in that she is loving and open and friendly and will answer any question you have. A lot of NFT artists who happen to be American, not quite that way. They're a little distant, a little haughty. If you have a genuine question about something, you can ask Ishita and she will answer you. And Sabet is the same way. I, I, Gabe Weiss is not. Wes Henry won't answer you about anything. Our friend Ian will answer you. He usually just prefers to answer with emoticons. It's fine. You accept people where they are. So Ishita, when I invited her to be part of this alpha test on a social media platform, was really the first big name, big selling name, who said, I'm in, I'll do it. And it was fabulous. So she's first up to set the stage, we hope, sometime today. And so I'm sending her questions. We're going back and forth. She's answering wonderfully. And then she happens to mention something. It doesn't really have to do with anything that we're doing immediately. It was informative in that it changed my perspective on where I thought she stood. And then I have to continue on just a little bit more about her, and then I'm going to switching it to Gordon. <laughs> So, as she said, after we've had this conversation, hey, I just want to let you know about this new project that I'm working on. And it's something they're doing bids, and it's like, okay, I really don't like to bid on auction. I like to go see the price, pay the price. I don't want to make an offer. I don't want to auction to people. What you're selling it for is what you value it for. Therefore, I will pay that price if it's something that I'm interested in adding to my collection. So she said, hey, there's this new project I'm working on. And we went back and forth for a long time on Twitter about this. And I'm not going to have that conversation revealed here. I'll just give you my general reaction to what was said. And I think like there are three or four other artists who are involved in this. I don't want to call it a scheme. It's a little different than what you would expect from an NFT artist. 
in my humble opinion. So this is the Whim Collection, Volume 1. This is from our dear friend Ishida, Cocoon of Dreams. Okay, love that. The What I see so far as my eye goes, I see an eye looking back at me, I love it. As I think it's start the auction starts, I think on Friday or it ends on Friday. I don't know. And then you scroll down. And you see this. This big ugly watermark W H I M. I've never seen that before. And then you scroll down a little bit more and you see a great big lock on the whim icon. And then you see, see this unlocked only on a whim. I'm not an NFT expert. I'm not a blockchain expert, but I sort of know what's going on. And what I'm seeing so far, I don't like this. Gordon says that is anything but whimsical. Very well said, Gordon. And the mystery continues. So here we go. Sale ends June 28. Okay, one day, four hours. Minimum bid, $300. I don't know if there, I don't think there are any bids on this. So here we go. This is where it gets. different. Meet me at the edge of where my wakefulness blends with my subconscious. Meet me at the corner of real and the infinite. Envelop me in these swirls of hazy warm light. Let the tendrils of tenderness flow through our veins. Let my roots be nourished in your light. Let my... Okay. All that's good. Now, here we go. 4K resolution cubist abstract faces. Here we go. Whim NFT is a brand new type of NFT that has all the functionality of a traditional NFT on the blockchain, which I don't believe is true. Let's find it out. The difference being the underlying art, the NFT, can only be seen by the owner of the NFT giving them the unique and exclusive experience of showcasing the NFT on the walls of their home. Note secondary sales of any piece from the Whim Collection Volume 1 can be sold with a Whim canvas, which I believe is like a TV screen from what I'm divining from this or a whim canvas will need to be purchased by the new owner in order to show off the whim NFT. Please confirm with the seller on the secondary market before purchasing. And here are some others from this collection. Locked. Locked and locked. View the collection. Okay, I will. Four items only. One, is the, one of them is our delightful friend, Ishida. Another one. This appears to be from our friend, Gabe, which disappoints me greatly. And here's another one. Now we go into the realm of not talking about specific people. But we're talking about this idea of what that piece of artwork is. The whole idea of the blockchain and NFT art is ownership is verifiable on the blockchain. And you can go there and look at it. And these NFT artists who create work have their work stolen every day. And I empathize and sympathize with that because the same thing happens to me and us. Gordon says, dare I send you the link to those weird televisions that sell for Ethereum? Yes, you can. If you dare. 
So the whole idea of the blockchain is that it's decentralized, it's open and accessible. And I'll look at that link in a minute, but I just want to get this out first. And I understand these NFT artists are upset that their artwork is being what they call right clicked stolen. And you right click on an image and save it locally. And hey, I stole this artist's image and I'm putting it on my website. Now I say to that argument, I have the same problem as a buyer. I paid a lot of money for that piece of artwork that I now own on the blockchain that I can verify. And people can right click on my image that I purchased and steal it and use it for their own terrible wishes. But I'm okay with that because as Twitter leads the way, I can use an NFT on my Twitter profile and people can click on it and check the veracity and the provenance and see, hey, he purchased this on this date. He owns that piece. It belongs to him. Now, what this win thing is, and I asked this artist who shall not be named, are you telling me that when you speak of the blockchain and the not right clickability, are you telling me that on the blockchain, if I look at that image, it has that ugly watermark on it with the lock? And I was told yes. And I said, well, what good does that do? I don't understand it. To me, the idea of NFTs and the blockchain is everything's open. That's what the Board Ape Yacht Club got right. Now, they sell one piece of artwork for $200,000, $300,000, $400,000. But once you own that ape, the creator of the ape is out of it. I own the ape. Seth Green owns his ape. We own the intellectual property to our apes. I don't have an ape, but if I did. And Seth Green has a TV show centered on his ape. That, to me, is the open future of the blockchain. To me, what this whim thing is, is a way to punish buyers by only allowing them to use the unlocked artwork on a proprietary device that is a screen that is shown in your home. I can't use it on my profile for a profile pic. I can't use it as a banner. I can't use it on my Discord server. Even though I paid for it, I don't have access to it. Because the creator, trying to protect their work from being copied, has decided to lock their artwork, lock me out of the artwork that I purchased for them, and I can only show it on a device that I'm told costs about one Ethereum, a thousand dollars. And if I sell that piece of artwork, I can sell it with the frame, or if I, you know, bought a couple of them, they have to go out and buy their own frame for a thousand dollars plus whatever I'm charging. Now, what if the frame goes bad? What happens to the piece of art? Well, you can't go like I can go now on the blockchain and, ret and retrieve a copy of the piece of art that I want to celebrate because it's watermarked and locked. I was very surprised to see an artist that I love and respect have that kind of hard heartedness toward the people who are trying to buy and celebrate her work. And when I mentioned that lightly, I was told just sharing information. Okay. That I understand. Now we're going to check out Gordon's link. Oh, here we go. Pre order the whim digital canvas. Now, as I understand it, this auction they're doing, you get a canvas, I think with the purchase. 
And I'm sure they thought these were all going to sell for $10,000, but so far they're selling for $300. But maybe it's going to go up because it's an auction. I don't know. But if you think about it, and it's a one of one, but it's a one of one that you can only show on a proprietary device in your home. Show the good people at home where you're looking at. Thank you, Gordon. This is the link that Gordon sent us. Whoops. Pre-order the whim digital canvas. Every size for everything. Choose from any array of sizes to suit your everyday need in the size space. Now, I don't know what size of whim you get with this NFT purchase. If you even get one, I'm confused by it, actually. Price is half an F going up and up in price. Now, I was told the one that was selling with our friends was worth one Ethereum. So we got to figure out how big that is. I guess this one, the S5. I don't get it. I think this is a very dangerous path to try to tread if you want to be an NFT artist. Now, if you want to be, this is trying to push us back to the pre-NFT blockchain days. Why even have this piece of artwork on the on the blockchain? Why call it an NFT? Just call it, you know, a proprietary piece of artwork. And as I said to our friend, why don't you just paint it on a canvas and sell it as a one of one? Because that's what you're doing. You can have it, hang it up in your home. Why would I want to hang up an NFT that's proprietary that I can only see on a device that I have to unlock in my home? I don't get it. I'm just sharing information. Okay. I'm just asking questions. Oh, there it is. So that's what it would look like, I guess, in your home, in your kitchen. Now, I know we've had these kind of things before where you could, you know, upload your photographs to a virtual frame and have them displayed in your home, which is sort of interesting. But I've never had it, heard it done with proprietary NFTs before. I think it defeats the whole purpose of what you're trying to do with an NFT. Bored apes do it right. We create it, you buy it, it's yours, we're out of it. There's no secondary market. Whatever you want to resell it for, you resell it. If you have a loss, it's a loss, it's a loss. Want to make a TV show? Go ahead. You want to rebuy it from a person who's blackmailing you? Go right ahead. We don't care. Oh, and you can also put it on the side. Now, does that mean you have to also somehow get your artwork to fit that way? I find the whole thing weird, and they're not even available yet. It's all pre-order. This is all sort of fantasy, I guess. I find it very... Very, very strange. 32 inches by 32 inches, which is big. I like that, actually. I don't think it's for me. And I'm very surprised that one of my favorite NFT artists is going in that direction. And maybe it's just an experiment to see if it sells. I don't know. But I hope it's not going to be the new wave of the future because I think it's frightening. Well, we talked a lot about art today. I didn't even get to talk about the hidden, interesting, underscored ramifications of this row decision from a completely different series points of view, but we'll do that tomorrow. We have lots of time. All we have is time, and then we have nothing. Hey, it's the way of life. But find people where they are, and sometimes you find people and you know people and you're having conversations with them and you find that they landed in a very different place than you expect. And you try to go with the flow and figure out where they're coming from and how to understand them a little bit better. If you have any questions or comments, you can email me, david at bowls.tv. On Facebook, hey, B-O-L-E-S is the main page, the business page. On Instagram or Bowls Books, Twitter, super follow. Lots of fun there. Lots of things going on there. Getting new super followers. Very fun. It's a whole secret conversation that I find really thrilling, actually. David Bowles on Twitter. 
On TikTok, Bowles TV, uploading more videos every day. Instagram, I think I said we're Bowles Books. And on Discord, if you so choose to join us there, here is the discernible link. So until tomorrow, stay dry if you're out in the rain. Have a wonderful nap, a great wake up, and gentle sleep. And when ye shall awaken, may your soul be filled with joy and compassion and understanding. Thank you for having us, Gordon says. Thank you for being here, my friend. I appreciate you very much. I'll see you tomorrow.